Awesome. Well, hello, everybody. Good evening. Again, I'm Alexa Herendorf, and I am a marine mammal biologist at the Southeast Field Station with FWC. And tonight I'm going to be presenting about the history, behavior, and our side of research and rescue of the Florida manatee. So manatees are, class of, or manatees are classified as sirenians, which also include dugongs and the extinct stellar sea cow. There are three species of manatees worldwide, the Amazonian found in the Amazon River, the West African found off of the coast of West Africa, and the West Indian, which is divided into two subspecies and found here in the US, throughout Caribbean islands, Central America, down to Northern South America. The Florida manatee is deemed our state's marine mammal and is found along the Florida coastlines. The manatee's closest relative is the elephant, and they use their prehensile lips similarly to how elephants use their trunk. And both species have nails just like we do. What I find most interesting is these two large animals stem from a small rodent-like animal called hyrax. Uh, manatee fossils have been found throughout the state of Florida for many years. There's documentation of them being hunted by Native Americans before Christopher Columbus came over here, and then again by early pioneers all for their meat, oil, and hides. In 1893, they became protected under Florida state law. In 1972, they were added to the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which prohibits taking any marine mammal from the wild. In 1973, they were added to the Endangered Species Act, which made it a violation to harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, capture, or collect endangered species. Finally, in 2017, they were reclassified from endangered to threatened due to their population increase over the recent years. So some general facts, their size, um, adult manatees on average are 10 feet in length and weigh about 1,000 pounds. Newborn calves typically are about 4 feet and only weigh about 60 pounds. So if you see a small manatee by, it, by itself, think to yourself, can one person lift it on their own? And if the answer is no, then it's probably not a first-year calf. So a little bit about reproduction. Female manatees reach sexual maturation at three to five years of age and males reach it at five to seven years old. The males only hang around the female for the breeding period and then, then they leave on to the next. A female carries her baby for 13 months once it's born and the cat or the cat will stay with her for about two years. Typically there's only a single offspring but twins have been documented. Like here are twins Millennium and Falcon. Their mom was, known, was a known manatee named Bonnie, and in 2016, she unfortunately was reported deceased with her two babies nearby. Millennium and Falcon were rescued as orphans and taken to rehab for two years before being released. They had continued to be seen together until we had to re-rescue Falcon for a boat strike last year. She has been released since, but we don't know if they've ever found each other again, but we're hopeful that they will. So about their distribution and migration, uh, the Florida manatee cannot survive in water temperatures below 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So they do migrate south during the winter and move north during the summer. This is a video um, further explaining their migration and it actually mentions one of my favorite manatees, Chessie. So let's see if I can get this to play. We all know that the Florida manatee is found in Florida but where else do they travel? Manatees are found in shallow, slow-moving rivers, estuaries, bays, canals, and coastal waterways. They need warm water and aquatic vegetation to survive. In the winter, they're concentrated in Florida, seeking refuge from cold water temperatures at warm water sites like springs or power plants. But in the summer, as water's warm, they start to travel. Along the Gulf of Mexico, they may go to Alabama or even as far west as Texas. Some Florida manatees have also been migrating to the south and have shown up in Mexico or Cuba. On the Atlantic coast, they're commonly sighted in the summer in Georgia and South Carolina, but they may go even further north. Manatees have been spotted as far north as Massachusetts. One manatee, who they nicknamed Chessie, was spotted in the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland in 1994. He had to be rescued as winter approached and he was brought back to Florida. The following year, he was sighted again up north in Rhode Island. Chessie was spotted a few more times along the East Coast over the years. In 2021, he was rescued in Southeast Florida after he was found swimming sideways and in poor body condition. Chessie was rehabilitated, released, and outfitted with a tracking device. 
who knows where he will end up this time. Do you have any more questions about manatees? Email us your questions to education at savethemanatee.org. So yeah, um, Chessie has been a famous manatee since the early 1990s. And as you saw in the video, um, we were actually the ones who rescued him last year. And honestly, it was like rescuing a celebrity. It will always be a highlight of my career. And um, so about their diet, as most of us know, manatees are herbivores, but they are also opportunistic. They consume about 10% of their body weight per day in different sea grasses, mainly manatee grass, turtle grass, and shoal grass. Their teeth are called marching molars because they form in the back of their mouth and move forward as the old worn down molars fall out. They have prehensile lips, like I mentioned before, and only drink fresh water. Manatees can also be seen lifting their front half out of water to eat grass on shoreline, like this one pictured here. We've, we actually nicknamed this one reindeer, and we've been observing her for years doing these, this type of behavior pretty much in the same area. Uh, they also will eat mangrove leaves, algae on docks, ropes and walls, tunicates, and even small fish within the grasses that they're eating. Some of their normal behavior consists of mostly sleeping and eating. They either sleep at the surface or on the bottom and poke their nose up for a breath about every 20 minutes. The breath rate increases with exerted energy, like when swimming, but one sign of distress that we do look for is if the, if the, if, if the breath rate drops consistently to less than one minute at a time. They're slow moving, averaging about three to five miles per hour, but they can swim faster if necessary. Unlike elephants, manatees are actually solitary animals, except for mom calf pairs. They have no natural predators, unless you count humans, and live harmoniously with alligators, crocodiles, and sharks. They're very curious and have been observed bothering gators. Manatees can crawl around in low water or even out of the water using their front or pectoral flippers. This photo just shows a bunch of manatees surface resting at an FPL warm water site in Riviera Beach on a cold winter day. We often get reports of lethargic manatees not moving around, barely breathing, and staying at the surface. But as I just went over in the last slide, this is normal sleeping behavior, and usually it's not a cause of concern. Okay, so now I'm going to go into our program, uh, which is all about manatee research and rescue. We're responsible for recovering carcasses, performing necropsies to determine the cause of death and gather data, rescuing ill, injured, or orphaned manatees, transporting rescued manatees to rehabilitation facilities, releasing them back into the wild after they complete rehab, as well as monitoring the population through photo identification, aerial surveys, and attaching GPS tracking gear. This map just shows the five different marine mammal field stations uh, with FWC throughout Florida. The Southeast Field Lab is in gray and obviously on the Southeast part of Florida. And as you can see, our coverage area is pretty large. It's from um, as North as St. Lucie County, West to Okeechobee County and all the way South through Monroe County. And there are only four of us to cover this whole area. We have Alexandra or Allie, our field station lead, Amber, that's me in the pink shorts, and then that's Blake. So we really rely on citizens calling the FWC hotline alert for reports about injured manatees. Um, so first, they will speak to a duty officer with our dispatch to obtain initial information. The dispatch then passes the caller name, number, and location, and reason for calling to the appropriate biologists. The biologists then call the citizen ourselves for more details of the manatee, such as size, behavior, breath rates, or if there are scars and wounds. We always ask for photos or GPS so we can better assess the animal, and depending on the situation, we'll ask for GPS coordinates too. We then decide if the manatee sounds normal or if some type of response is needed. If it does sound like a rescue and response is necessary, we'll always get someone out there ASAP to get eyes on it or get a better assessment. These people include FWC law enforcement, local officers, FWC volunteers, partner agencies that work with marine mammals, or park staff based on the location. These first responders have been trained with basic knowledge of manatee behavior so they know what to look for and may be asked to stay with the manatee until the rescue team arrives. These are the five main reasons for rescue. Um, we have watercraft, entanglement, entrapment, orphan calves, or natural, and of course I'm going to go into more detail about each one. 
But first, this is rescue data from 2021 divided by county and reason for rescue. As you can see, watercraft and natural tend to be the main reasons. On average, watercraft is the biggest reason for rescue, but during this East Coast Unusual Mortality Event, or UME, regarding loss of seagrass, we have rescued a higher number of thin animals. Last year, these animals presented mostly positively buoyant, unable to submerge. Of course, red tide rescues, um, rescued animals from the Gulf Coast would all have also attributed to the natural selection or section. So far this year on the Atlantic coast, we're seeing more thinness and emaciation, but of course still watercraft per usual. Preliminarily this year, we have 24 watercraft and 34 natural rescues to date. Last year, the Southeast Field Lab ended 2021 with 50 rescues, 15 of which were in Miami-Dade County. So our two main rescue techniques are open water-based and land-based net sets. We have a special boat with an inboard engine and a transom in the back that comes fully off so we can pull the manatee on board safely. We start by setting a large circle with a net around the manatee and you can see the manatee is definitely inside the net there. There are four point people, two people pulling leads and two people pulling in floats as the rest of the rescue team fire hoses the net near the tower to ensure enough room for the manatee to be pulled on board. As the net becomes fully pulled in and the manatee approaches the boat, we bag the manatee and pull it on board, ideally head first and back up. We get it fully on and then put the transom back as we make our way back to land. The land base sets are similar, just of course without a boat. A good, a good example of this is in January of this year, Fort Lauderdale Airport security called us saying that there's a manatee in a man-made pond inside the airport perimeter right next to the runway. It made its way through a broken gated culvert and right into the airport. A rescue was conducted and the manatee was deemed healthy on assessment, so he was immediately relocated to the Stranahan River nearby and the airport fixed this broken gate, so we hopefully do not have this problem again. Land-based sets do require people in the water so we can essentially still make that circle around the manatee. We do still have the four point people pulling in leads and floats with the rest of the team still fire hosing behind. And we close the bag and pull the manatee on land before placing it in the stretcher and ultimately getting it into our transport truck to bring to rehab. So the first reason for rescuing is watercraft. We see two different kinds of boat strikes. The more obvious is penetrating with sharp cuts often caused by propellers. These can cut through tissue, organs, and even bone. The less obvious but very detrimental boat strike is impact. It's blunt trauma from the boat hull, skeg, lower end unit, and sometimes even the prop itself. This causes internal issues such as broken or fractured ribs, internal bleeding, bruising, and often damaged lungs. These present to us as excessively buoyant and listing at the surface, sometimes even fully rolling, but not in a playful way like they can do. Boat strikes near the head or upper body are typically more harmful than strikes closer to the tail. But even strikes that don't cause an immediate issue can show up later on as infections or even abscesses. Manatee rib bones have no bone marrow, so they are extremely dense and heavy. New bone will grow around the fractured, broken, or infected areas and can end up much larger and abnormally shaped as shown in the remodeled photo. The normal rib bone is right next to it to show the comparison. The penetrating trauma shows a paddle with fully cut propeller wounds. The impact trauma shows what looks like a single superficial wound, but the manatee is fully listing on its side. As you can see, the paddle is 90 degrees. This tells us there's internal, internal damage and we are most likely dealing with a pneumothorax or air, air outside of the lung, but still in the lung cavity, probably caused by one or multiple fractured or broken ribs. Manatees have two separate lung cavities and can essentially live without one of their lungs for a period of time, which was what was incredibly going on in that lower left photo. I wanted to point out the difference between old scars versus fresh wounds. Scars usually heal with uneven margins around the old wound and look off white, tan, or even yellow in color. Fresh impact wounds are usually white with skin peeled back and fresh penetrating wounds may show pink muscle, blood, flaps of skin, and wound depth is usually pretty obvious. 
And here are some examples of listing. When we ask citizens if the manatee is even at the surface or favoring a side, this is what we're looking for. And we'll always ask which side it's favoring, if it's able to submerge, if it's able to stay under, or if it pops right back up like a balloon. Manatees can have a slight list where they're just barely favoring a side or a severe list where they are fully swimming sideways. I have a video right here um, of a manatee we rescued back in December 2021, and it shows the animal trying to submerge but physically unable to due to the air trapped outside of the lung but in the lung cavity. You can see what I mean by it being unable to submerge. And uh, as it also shows, it pops right back up in the beginning. And then the bottom right photo is of the same manatee, so you can see how descended that right side is. The next reason for rescue is entanglement, which we unfortunately do see a lot of. Manatees can become entangled in monofilament, crab traps, or other debris. Entanglement in fishing gear like monofilament nets and ropes can impact their ability to swim and feed and can cause chronic unhealed wounds. We have a handful of manatees that we refer to as serial entanglements down in the Keys. For example, Dooley. Dooley has been rescued by our field station a total of eight times since 1999 and most recently in 2020, which is what these photos are from. A manatee vet disentangled and surgically removed all of the embedded monofilament and Dooley was released on site. She was confirmed to be pregnant during this rescue via ultrasound, and we're actually currently monitoring her weaned calf because it already has flipper entanglements. It clearly did inherit Dooley's curiosity and learned this behavior from her mom, or from its mom. I also want to stress the importance of the public not removing any entanglement because, as you can see in the right flipper photo, you most likely won't be removing the embedded portions. These, these must be surgically removed and the flipper itself may actually need to be amputated. Other entanglements include crab traps and other types of debris like ingested fishing lures or hooks, which typically rust out if stuck in the mouth or um, we can also see bike tires and package straps around the body. You can see the bike tire is already embedded on the body, which can cause deformities as a manatee grows. Crab traps mostly involve float line around one or both flippers, body, neck, or tail. The East Central Field Station had a manatee unable to fully surface and stuck in the same spot for a couple of days back in December 2020. Our team went up to help and we pulled up the manatee and it was entangled in a crab trap that was attached to an entire fish cleaning station. We think the table probably had a crab trap tied to it and the whole table was blown away during a hurricane at some point, but no wonder it was unable to move from the same spot for a couple days. Entrapment can also occur, um, such as in culverts, drainage pipes, locks, dams, or other water control structures. Manatees often enter these inaccessible areas due to high water levels from storms or tide changes and become trapped when the water recedes. The man this manatee was stuck in a storm drain and had to be removed by trained professionals who are allowed to enter small underground areas that we are not able to get into. Calves can become orphaned for a few different reasons, but either way, they are not associated with an obvious mother. They're less than six feet long, so again, one person should be able to lift a calf by themselves one to two people at six feet. When orphaned, they don't know how to feed on their own, so they're usually thin, lethargic, and staying in one spot, but sometimes are seen trying to suckle on larger objects in the water. Moms sometimes park their calves as they go feed, and they'll come back later on for them. We often wait 24 hours to give mom a chance to come back for her calf before going for a rescue. Orphan calves must stay in rehab for two years until they're old enough to survive in the wild on their own. Once in a while, other females' manatees may actually adopt an orphan, or we've even documented females stealing babies. <laughs> if mom and calf are together, but one of them needs rescuing, we will always rescue both to make sure they are not separated, but we do try to rescue the calf before mom. 
In March 2021, we rescued four manatees, one adult male, and these three orphan calves, two of which are still in rehab until they're old enough to be released in the wild. So I'm gonna talk about a few of the natural categories, starting with cold stress. This occurs in winter when water temperatures drop below 68 degrees Fahrenheit. It'll show as areas of bleaching or white spots around the face, axillary area and paddle, which we refer to as halo tail because it's just pretty much white all around the outside of the, of the paddle. Visible abscesses, unresolved sores, heavy barnacle or algae load can occur and they're usually underweight. Cold stress tends to affect smaller manatees or manatees far away from a viable warm water source. Here are two examples of animals that purposely stranded themselves, which both are usually cause, are usual causes that I'm going to go more in depth over in the next couple slides. This one with a head wound is from this past April uh, down in Marathon. It did beach itself after being hit by a boat to the head. And um, the other one is just a red tide manatee. Here, I wanna stress that animals do beach themselves on purpose and they should never be pushed back in. So a little bit more about tidally stranded manatees. Um, they can become tidally stranded due to receding tides. Depending on location and the tide schedule, we may monitor or move the manatee into deeper water. If the manatee is unhealthy, we of course will rescue for treatment. Please again, do not push these marine mammals back into the water, any marine mammal. Biologists have to assess because marine mammals do do this when they're feeling ill or possibly death is near. These photos actually are a unique case though and show a manatee that was stranded on the side of the road due to unusually high tides and flooding from a storm and was stuck once they did recede. Red tide is a natural occurrence with higher than normal concentrations of the algae Carinia brevis. It produces a neurotoxin called a brevitoxin, which affects an animal's lack of coordination causes involuntary, involuntary muscle twitches, seizures, inability to swim, which of course can all lead to drowning. Red tide isn't as prevalent on the East Coast, but it can definitely still occur. So with this slide, the main point I really wanna make is to please call our wildlife hotline if you see a manatee that looks anything like these two. Um, we call this one on the left a peanut head because the skull is visible and we should never be able to see the skull outline. And then the visible ribs and spine, of course, is a sign of emaciation. Um, we should never be able to see the ribs, if you see or feel the ribs or the spine. Um, we did rescue these two this year. They are still in rehab. Um, I'm not going to go into depth about the unusual mortality event because it is an ongoing investigation and us manatee biologists are solely continuing to rescue critical animals and collect data from necropsies photo and photo ID. But the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the FWC Unified Command oversee everything related to the UME and they have helped us tremendously get through this hard time. This beautiful brand new rescue truck was donated to our lab this year by Florida Power and Light. Thank you, FPL. Our old truck from 2010 is in the background, but this new one has been a game changer, especially for safely transporting rescues to keep in Key West all the way up to SeaWorld in Orlando, which could take all night. So just to summarize, if you do see an injured manatee, of course, please report it to our hotline at 888-404-3922. Take photos, videos, and please get a GPS location so that we can e more easily find where you're at within the manatee. You may be asked to stay with the manatee until the rescue team arrives and pat yourself on the back because you just helped save a manatee's life. So after they complete rehab, um, they are released as close to the place that we rescue them as possible so that they are they know the area already. Um, so this video just shows um, Amber, who again is our field station lead, explaining the process of releases. Hello everyone, thank you for joining. My name is Amber Howell. I'm the lead manatee biologist for the Southeast Field Station for Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Did you know that November is Manatee Awareness Month? I'm gonna to explain to you what that means and how you can help. 
But first, we are here at Shepherd Park in Stewart today to release a manatee that was rescued back in May and has undergone rehabilitation and is medically cleared for release. This manatee was called into our FWC hotline by a concerned citizen after observing the manatee floating higher out of the water than normal with a dry spot on its back. Upon receiving photos from the caller, manatee biologists noticed that the manatee was not level and the right side was higher in the water with a fresh superficial watercraft wound on the upper back. This is an indication that the manatee has internal trauma related to the boat injury scene. A rescue team of FWC biologists, FWC law enforcement, and Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute were able to rescue the eight-foot female in Miami Sea Aquarium met on site to transport the manatee to their facility for rehabilitation. Today, the manatee has fully recovered and has been medically cleared for release. During release, FWC biologists will collect data for this individual. This includes taking measurements such as total body length and girths, which can be used to calculate a body mass index to ensure that the manatee has a healthy body weight for its size class, which can be compared to future sightings of this individual, as well as contribute data for the overall manatee population. Watercraft related scars and identifiable markings are highlighted with a grease marker, which comes off in the water after a couple days. This is done so the individual can be inputted into the manatee photo identification database where the scars can be matched up with any photos taken in the future. This helps biologists study the migration of individuals and their life history. Since this is a female, we hope that she will be seen with a calf in the future, which will be documented and added to her calving history. Lastly, a pit peg, also known as a microchip, is inserted into the manatee, which can be scanned in the future in case the manatee is captured again. This is not the same as a satellite tag, which you may see on some of our other manatees. So we will not be able to track her movements, but we'll be able to identify the individual with a unique pit tag number. Once all the data is collected, the manatee is carried into the water for release. We pick the location based on where the animal is captured. This manatee was found right here at Shepherd Park in Stewart. So we're putting her back exactly where she was captured from. We do this because manatees know the area. They know where to find food and the warm water sites nearby for winter. This is a great day for all as this is the best outcome we hope for when responding to rescues. November is- I'm gonna stop it there. The rest is some very interesting information, but um, I kind of go over a lot of it too in this. So continuing on. Hello everyone, thank you. Um, so now this is a video about GPS satellite tags and it shows how and why we tag manatees. So I'll play this first. That measurement they're taking right there, that's usually right where the belt is going to fit for that satellite tracker. which is right the base of the tail. And that was actually Chessie again. Um, so as you can see, the, be the belt goes around the peduncle. The tag has an antenna and each tag has its own special sc color scheme to more easily identify which animal is which in real time. These tags are most often confused by citizens uh, for buoy entanglements, but they do feel at ease when we explain what they are and that biologists track the whereabouts of the manatees because of these tags and regular in-water health assessments are performed. These tags never harm the manatee. They're placed just tight enough around the peduncle to allow for growth and the tether will automatically release from the belt if it feels any tension at all. These tags stay on for about a year before automatically detaching themselves. They provide valuable information on individual movements, habitat use, and adaptability of rehabilitated animals that we were that may have been considered to be a high risk to be put back into the wild like orphan calves. If you see a tagged manatee, please report it to our hotline as tags actually can malfunction and it may just happen to be one that we've been looking for. Um, but of course, please do not attempt to remove these tags. That has happened before and the result was not, was not good. And 
And one more video. This is about mating herds. Uh, spring and summertime are the months for mating. We do get calls nearly every day about mating herds. So I just wanted to show this informative video um, of our state marine mammal rescue coordinator, Andy, explaining what's occurring during a mating herd and what to do if you come across one. Hey guys, we're out here at Philby Park in Safety Harbor and we're with the Manatee Mating Herd. This was called in earlier today, so we're out here taking a look. It's a pretty typical mating herd. It's a focal female. She's the one on the far end with a scar, but the males are trying to get underneath her, trying to trying to find a position to mate with her. The very typical scene where you have males kind of climbing on top of each other, trying to get position underneath her. She's probably put some sort of pheromone in the water that, that attracts the males. You have other males out here. They'll come and go throughout the day. Uh, they may leave and come back, but she'll pretty much stay in shallow water the entire time. There'll be periods of quiet where the female's in shallow water, and then sometimes when she drifts offshore or they push her offshore, it'll, it'll erupt with all kinds of activity while they're trying to get underneath her, which seems to be going on right now. Manatees typically will begin mating, uh, especially after a, a winter time. So we'll see it kind of start start climbing in, in April and peaking in the summer and early early fall. So if you're ever out on the beach and you see a manatee mating herd, uh, we ask that you stay back. It's a very dangerous situation because you have thousand pound animals rolling on top of each other. They're very focused on mating with with the female and, and probably wouldn't even notice you were there. But the danger is if they start rolling and getting active, they may roll on top of you. Um, they're obviously grabbing on anything they can. So um, that's public to stay back, report it to us through our 800 number. That's 888-404-3922. Let us know about the mating herd. Let us know what you're seeing, because sometimes there's something wrong with the female. About 99% of the time, we're okay. But every once in a while, the female's injured, or the tide will go out and they'll become stranded. So we kind of want to keep our understanding of what's going on out in the area. After the mating herd has ended, if the female becomes pregnant, she'll carry her calf for about 13 months. Once it's time to give birth, she'll find a small, quiet cove, canal, or secluded area to give birth to her calf. After birth, manatee calves stay with their moms for about two years. During this important window, manatee calves learn a lot from their mom, including where to find feeding grounds, such as seagrass flats, where to find warm water in the wintertime, and where to find fresh water. So if you want to support manatee research, rescue, and conservation efforts, please purchase a manatee license plate. All right, so going into a little bit about mortalities, uh, this chart shows mortalities from the last five years, plus where we're at in, up to the end of July, 2022. A few of these categories are very similar to rescues like watercraft, cold stress and natural, but floodgate or lock refers to manatees being killed by crushing or drowning in the floodgates or canal locks. Other human related, um, reasons include vandalism, poaching, entrapment in pipes and culverts, complications due to entanglement in ropes, lines and nets, or ingestion of fishing gear or debris. Perinatal refers to manatees less than or equal to 150 centimeters in length, where they were not determined to have died due to human-related causes, and many of them actually are just stillborns. Undetermined often means the carcass was too decomposed to find a cause of death on necropsy, and undetermined or other means a cause of death was unable to be found because everything inside actually appears pretty normal. Verified and not necropsy, um, they're reported and then they're verified by a biologist or another reliable source like a volunteer or a FWC officer. And some of them do still receive some varying levels of examination and tissue collection dependent on who's able to go. I wanted to just show that um, for our lab, in 2020, we ended the year with 123 mortalities, and then 2021 spiked right up to 213 mortalities. And so far to date, we are at 97 for our lab. And then uh, these numbers just show what it, they were down in Miami-Dade, 24 in 2020, 31 in 2021, and so far nine this year. So for necropsy, um, it's essentially an autopsy for animals. We usually perform them in the field or at the lab, and they're always consistent, high-quality postmortem examinations where we collect tissue samples, genetics, and always scan for a pit tag. 
Uh, the PIT tag is, again, not the same as the GPS satellite tag. They are essentially microchips that are placed. There's two of them placed in each above each shoulder. They're pretty much the same exact microchips that we use on our dogs or cats. And the, the scanner is pretty much the same thing. So a certain number will pop up and that'll tell us if this animal has been rescued before. So why do we determine the cause of death? Um, of course, to record the death and location. Management, where, they're, where are they dying? Are there speed zones in this area? Are the speed zones even effective? Do they need to be changed at all? Um, life history, general health, population status, things like that. And then of course, to characterize the internal anatomy to further research and understand these animals. So again, just to summarize, if you see a deceased manatee, always call our 888 number, take photos, videos, and GPS location. Um, the GPS location is pretty important in this one because um, you don't really have to stay with the animal until a team gets there, but we need to know where it's at so we are able to find it again. Uh, if a manatee is back up, please watch for at least 20 minutes just to make sure it doesn't lift its head for a breath because as you know, surface resters may be completely still until they lift their head for a breath. But signs of a deceased manatee include it being bloated, belly up, flippers may be straight up in the air, which kind of look like a, a football goal. Um, you'll probably have a bad smell and we'll observe flies or vultures surrounding it. So what can you do? So of course you can purchase a Save the Manatee specialty license plate. Um, generally, most of our funding comes from these. You can be active in your community by keeping manatee habitats clean, including the shoreline, beach, park, roadside, Cleanup events are always great. Of course, safe boating. Please pay attention to all waterway signs, including manatee zones. Using propeller guards definitely helps. Wearing polarized sunglasses is a huge one. Even we have to wear them all the time on the water. It makes a huge difference because even if they're just right below the surface, sometimes they're really hard to see with the glare of the sun. And avoid traveling in seagrass or other shallow areas. Please recycle monofilament fishing line in designated bins near docks, ramps, or tackle shops. And please never feed or water the manatees. They will, they do love water and food from humans, of course. So they quickly learn to associate boats with fresh water and food, which of course get them way too close to humans and ultimately too close to boats. And that of course would cause a boat strike. Other things that you could do are volunteer. So you could volunteer your time to educate others with what you've learned about keeping manatees in their habitat clean and safe with your local environmental organizations or conduct a community service project benefiting manatee conservation. Or you can always volunteer with us. We're always searching for incredible volunteers that just love the manatees as much as we do and want to help out in any way. You would learn how to assess a man manatee behavior, respond to injured, distressed, or deceased animals, depending on what you're comfortable with. You can assist with res rescues and necropsies, again, depending on what you're comfortable with. And we love inviting our volunteers to releases. It's a really special time for us to all get together. And it's a happy moment, as you saw in the video. So you can email Blake at blakefawcett at myfwc.com to find out more about becoming a volunteer with the FWC Manatee Program. And we, are, we do accept internships for recent college graduates. Um, we rely heavily on our interns. And as I said in the very beginning, we, you get amazing experience from it. So oh, that information ultimately also goes to Blake. She's in charge of interns and volunteers. So always trying to get some more good people in this field, people who just want to help. So that is my presentation. Um, again, call the FWC Wildlife Alert Hotline 888-404-FWC-3922 to report an injured, distressed, or deceased animal. And thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you guys listening to my presentation. I hope you learned something. Thank you so much. Yeah. I know I have a bunch of questions that I have uh, written here <laughs> for myself. So um, if anybody else has some questions and wants to go first, um, otherwise I will ask away. Um, let's see, we actually have some in the chat. One of them is mine. Uh, what is the, the average lifespan of a manatee? You might so have said it's mentioned it, that. Yeah, it's kind of hard to say in the wild um, because we do have, you know, they get hit by boats so often. Um, 
it's hard to say for sure in the wild, but we do have them documented back to the 80s or 90s, still alive today. Wow. Um, the longest living manatee was named Snooty, and that was in captivity. So we do know that they he lived till about 69 and actually did not die due to natural causes. It was something associated with the tank. So he could have potentially lived even longer. So oh we do know that their lifespan can be pretty long. Um, yeah. Oh, the six, think, 70 years, that is not what I was expecting. Um, it's amazing, though. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, but probably not in the wild, 70 years. Makes but, sense. Yeah. yeah. The same thing with pelicans. We have some that are, uh, I guess, nearing their like 30 year mark with us. Um, but in the wild, not that long, unfortunately. Oh, see, I didn't know that about pelicans. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. They can live very, very long time in captivity. Um, Let's see, Trina asked, how many mortalities are related to starvation if they can't find enough seagrass to eat? So all those numbers um, can definitely be found on the website and um, individual reports as well, or not actual reports, but just more information on different different mortalities, different carcasses that we have necropsied. Um, I don't have a specific number. I can look into that if you'd like me to and get back to you about it. But but the, these last couple of years, absolutely, have been a huge increase on the rescues and mortalities of thin animals. Um, that's really that's really been the main thing we've been seeing, unfortunately. That's a shame. Yeah. Um, Amanda raised her hand. If you want to go ahead, Amanda. Yeah, I had a quick question. Um, kind of piggybacking on that, how their seagrass is dying off and everything, and they're having a hard time finding food. Are you guys seeing more often? Um, I've seen some pictures of them like eating fish. Is that now becoming more of a thing because they've always been herbivores, but are you guys seeing out in the wild now that they're eating um, more fish and other like protein sources? Um, I don't know if we've seen them actually completely like switch their diet from seagrass to the fish. So the seagrass die off is mainly in one area. And unfortunately it is an area that a lot of them are very used to during their migration patterns. So once they actually get down to like our area, Broward, Miami, even um, there is seagrass, so they are able to eat, and um, they do. There are fish that are it's like little fish stuck in the seagrass that they may eat opportunistically. Um, we haven't really seen them like fully just eating fish only, and a lot okay. of times, depending on where they're at, um, if they're surrounded by mangroves, they will just be moving those branches, picking at the leaves, and eating other sources of greens. Okay, so they're still like. It's just, I thought it was more of a widespread problem. Sorry, I missed the first half. You might've gone over that, but oh, so the seagrass, yeah. like down here in South Florida, it's not as big of an issue for them. Correct. Yes. Down here it's better. Um, it's really central, East central, like central, um, Florida, just above us, like Brevard County area. And once they get to us, it's, you know, sometimes it may be too late for them to be able to eat enough food to gain back what they need to be healthy um but a lot of times they are able to find food down here and like be okay and kind of put on some more weight so it's better in our area i will say it's definitely better in our area gotcha okay cool so uh, a huge problem that we also see um, are obviously our orphaned animals. Uh, and it was interesting that you said that you usually wait 24 hours for people to come or for people to wait to see if the manatee's mother comes back. Uh, it's also something we kind of suggest is waiting for the parents to come back. Um, so I was just wondering, like, what percentage of time do you see that the manatees just, like you said, um, parked somewhere and not actually orphaned? Um, is it like half the time? Is it not super common? Is it super common? It is pretty common. Um, I don't know a percentage, um, but it's definitely common for them to just like, like you said, park them and go off and get some food. And then as they get their nutrition, then they're able to give nutrition to their babies. So it's kind of the, the calf kind of knows to just stay in that spot or it does just stay in that spot. Cause it's just the behavior that it does. Yeah. And yeah, mom usually does come back, but there are those instances where I mean, even, even just like humans, sometimes they may want to give up their baby or something like that. So sometimes they don't come back, of course, in those cases, then, mm. then they are true orphans, but mm. yeah, no, uh, deer also a lot of times yes. uh, will leave their babies. <laughs> Let's see. 
Uh, we have a question. Uh, do you have any thoughts on if the manatee might be reclassified as a species endangered status? Are we close to this? I don't think we're close to it. Um, of course, we did lose about uh, just about 10% of the population last year, but their, mm -hmm. their population did regrow enough, like I said earlier, to become to get off of the endangered list and onto a threatened list. And we're not at the point yet where they're going to go back to being endangered just yet. I don't, I don't think it's going to head that way. Um, they are obviously still mating. They, like I said, we get calls about that every day. So that's, that's something good. Um, they're still produced, they're still breeding. So hopefully that'll be enough to, to keep the population up. Awesome. And they're doing okay on the Gulf coast too. So well, that's good to hear yeah. <laughs> after, you know, kind of a, a sad presentation, um, but really, really um, educational and important also. Um, so maybe I just misheard or didn't totally understand um, the part about intentional strandings. Um, so you said that if like sometimes they will intentionally strand themselves. Can you like explain that a little more? I thought that was yeah. interesting. Or like, of how course. would you know if it was intentional versus, um, you know? Yeah. So mm -hmm. often if they're feeling ill, if they're honestly even feeling like they may die. Um, we see this in dolphins and whales and including manatees. That's when they beach themselves to just kind of to, to die essentially. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, we've been seeing it with manatees more so like in that, that photo I showed of the boat strike to the head. Um, I guess that manatee was in a lot of pain most likely and did not think it would survive. So it, it did, if it was, let's say it may have been beached on accident and then it just did not have enough energy to leave. But I think that it did end up beaching itself in that area. Um, and it does occur as well with red tide, but yeah, sometimes they will do it on purpose. We have also rescued an animal this year for the same, the same issue, but it was because it was thin. So also it mm. may have been not feeling great, potentially thinking it may die as well. Oh. But That's so uh, interesting, that, like the instincts that the animals have. That, yeah, I kind of feel like we can't 100% say it for sure, but it's definitely, it definitely trends that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I forgot to mention the the one with the boat strike head wounds is still alive. It's got, he's gone through a couple different surgeries and um, they were able to remove some fractured skull out and he's doing okay. So that's been fantastic. Oh that was one that we were kind of worried about. And that was down in Marathon. So that drive all the way from Marathon to Orlando was a little taxing as well, but he made it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, that's nice. End on some good news. Right. <laughs> we always love that. Um, Jonathan asked, what are the major impacts of coastal pollution on the habitat and survival of the manatees? So definitely if humans weren't around, they would be thriving, <laughs> of course, as most wildlife probably would be. Um, but we really do see an issue with humans and leaving a lot of fishing gear out, like I was mentioning about entanglements. Manatees are so curious and especially our serial entanglements down in the Keys, they just go straight for a crab trap or, or something that looks interesting. And they will, they will, they feel it with their flippers. So they will touch it. And then if it gets stuck, they will start to roll around. And then that's how it gets very badly embedded over time. And, um, we definitely in necropsies also find a good amount of plastic in the stomach or throughout the intestines, um, different, different things, definitely fishing line, um, a lot of debris. So, and then of course, I mean, again, I don't really want to go into too much about the seagrass loss, but that is because of pollution. That is because of humans over fertilizing their lawns and, just too much fertilization in general, that area up there does not have a way for fresh water to really come in. Um, there's not an inlet for a really long way. I don't even know, a lot of miles. So it's just like kind of the same stagnant water in that area. So it's not really being flushed out. So because of humans polluting it, it has essentially killed off all of the seagrass there. Hmm. So physical and chemical pollution. Yes. Kinda. Absolutely. Whirlwind effect. Um, so Jacqueline is actually one of our rehabbers. So she has an interesting medical question here. Uh, what kind of anesthesia is used for the surgeries? Curious because they're huge. <laughs> That's a great question. So I, I don't know. I've never seen a manatee under anesthesia, have not been part of their surgeries. It is a dream of mine 
because I was a certified vet tech before doing marine mammal work. And so I loved surgery of dogs and cats. And I would love to be a part of a manatee surgery. Um, I don't know what kind. Um, I can ask. I will ask SeaWorld and I can uh, get back <laughs> to you on that one because that's a very interesting question. I'm interested too. <laughs> I did have a question about the uh, waterways by the Florida Power and Light stations. Mm -hmm. um, it, how do you generally see that the people that work there are treating the manatees? Are they respectful? They have certain they protocols? Yeah, so um, that one photo that I showed of the FPL in Riviera Beach, they actually had so many manatees come that they eventually made a an a building that is called Manatee Lagoon. And they do have a bunch of people come every day to look at these manatees. And they have manatee masters there who teach a bunch of information to the public about manatees. And um, FPL really does seem to care about manatees and wildlife in general. It's, it's, it's pretty great working with them, to be honest. Um, so the warm water sites, you know, these, these big electrical companies, they, they output a bunch of warm water in order to keep their, their stuff cooler. So the manatees know instinctually because they've done this migration so much, they know where these warm water sites are. And they're immediately, as, as they're migrating wherever, whichever way they're going, usually in the winter coming down, um, they will stop at these warm water sites so that they can warm up and there's usually some food around and a lot of them congregate together to keep warm. So it definitely is dependent on the year. Like this year, we had a pretty warm winter. So we personally did not see too many at our FPL sites. But historically, there are hundreds of them that gather in the wintertime. And for those of you who may not have heard or don't know, um, my beautiful Zoom background here uh, is actually a rendering of our new property, uh, which is right along the Little River, where we also get um, tons and tons of manatees aggregating every year. So a big part of our property, and other than being an education center and our re new rehab center and everything, uh, is also going to be a manatee viewing location. So uh, Alexa, we might be calling you in case you see anything suspicious. Um, I love that. We may have to make it a photo ID site. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, we have um, drone photographs of like 30 or 40 there at a time. Oh, amazing. We definitely rely heavily on photo identification. And that is how we're able to track manatees from the 80s or 90s uh, based on a lot of their scars. So awesome. we have a huge uh, photo ID database. And if you ever get some good ones with scars, you can always feel free to email them to me. Okay. Synergy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you for that. Yes, yes. And thank you guys all for joining us and for caring about the manatees and you know, spending an hour of your Wednesday here with us to learn and uh, have some fun. Yes, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate you being here. <laughs>